So are you ready for more? Yes. Are you sure? Yeah? <laughs> okay. If you ever feel a bit bamboozled or unsure what I'm talking about, can you everyone understand me okay? Am I talking clearly? Okay, yeah. yeah. If, okay. If you can't understand, just please let me know and I will we'll try to do something about that. Uh, and also, if you think sometimes it gets difficult to follow, I mean, it all depends on how long you've been around uh, Buddhism and all of these things. Uh, some of you may find it difficult. Uh, please say, please speak up. Uh, and uh, sometimes you don't know what to ask because you feel so completely lost. <laughs> But that's okay, you can just ask me to repeat it or to explain it better or whatever, and that's also okay. Don't have to, anything is fine if, you know, because it's people come at all different levels. I don't really expect you to understand straight away what is going on here. Huh? So, uh, okay, let us uh, continue. And what I'm going to do next is to explain dependent origination in uh, in brief, uh, I'm going to go through all of the various factors uh, fairly quickly. I don't know how long it's going to take, probably not that long. Uh, and then later on I want to go into it in more detail. This is just to give you a background feeling for what this is about uh, before we kind of delve into the details of each one. Otherwise, uh, if we go to the details straight away, it's going to be too uh, too much, I think, to really understand the overview. Once you have the overview, then I think we can go into the details. That's kind of my uh, pedagogical approach. So let's see if that approach works. Not sure, but we'll see, we'll see what happens there. So now we come to this sutta on page 36 uh, called Dependent Origination. And it is the first sutta. It says the SN12.1. SN again is the Sangyuta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. Number 12 is the Nidana Sangyuta. Uh, Nidana means like cause or source or origin of something. So this is the whole collection of suttas on dependent origination. And this is the very first, number one there, uh, in that collection of suttas. Uh, so this kind of sets the tone for the rest of the uh, collection. And for that reason, it is like the foundational way that dependent origination is expressed in the suttas. So, um, let's have a look at this very briefly. This is how it works. Uh, so, I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, another Pindika's monastery. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants. Venerable Sir, they replied, and uh, the Buddha said this. So this is the standard opening of almost all the suttas. Uh, you will notice how common it is that things happen in Anathapindika's monastery. And uh, you know the reason why that is, uh, why it might be? Uh, I, according to some, a certain tradition, if you c couldn't remember which monastery a sutta was spoken, uh, then the, the auto kind of autofill in her was Ananta Pindika's monastery here. Yeah? So if you weren't sure where it was spoken, then you add Ananta Pindika's monastery at the, at the beginning here. And if you wasn't sure who the people were, then there were certain people you put in, the, in place as well. Here. <laughs> so this is according to a Tibetan tradition, apparently, here, of early Buddhism, how, you, how the suttas were, how the narrative part of the suttas was constructed. Because remember, the, this is the narrative part, this is the story behind it. This is not actually the sutta. The sutta is what is spoken by the Buddha. So this narrative, the story around the sutta, would always have been added later on, after the event. And sometimes you just couldn't remember where it was, yeah, who had spoken. It was a long time afterwards, it would have gone out of the window. So for that reason, it's not entirely strange. Uh, but uh, maybe it would have been better to leave it blank, but uh, in some traditions they decided, well, if you don't remember, then the auto fill-in is another Pindika's monastery. That's the kind of default location for all the suttas. And that could be a reason why so many suttas are said to be from that monastery. Don't know. Anyway, what do you feel about that? Is that good or bad? Good? Okay, you think it's good? Okay, good. And one person is good. <laughs> okay. So it's good to know anyway, so then you don't take it so seriously where it, was, where it happened. Uh, in other words, it doesn't matter so much. 
Mendicants, <coughs> Venerable Sir, they replied, and the Buddha said this, Mendicants, I will teach you dependent origination. Listen and pay close attention. I will speak. Yes, sir, they replied, and the Buddha said this. And what is dependent origination? Ignorance is a condition for choices. Choices are a condition for consciousness. Consciousness is a condition for name and form. Name and form are conditions for the six sense fields. The six sense fields are conditions for contact. Contact is a condition for feeling. Feeling is a condition for craving. Craving is a condition for grasping. Grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition for old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress to come to be. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. This is called dependent origination. So, make sense or maybe sort of? Yeah? <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know, when I first came across this teaching, I thought, what is this all, what is this all about? This is really strange, yeah, this is kind of really weird. Ignorance leads to choices. Usually, choices, usually the word, uh, this is the word sankara, which is behind choices, uh, usually rendered, rendered as volitional formations, uh, which is really, in my opinion, a completely incomprehensible expression, volitional formations, don't know what that means. Uh, choices is much better because you can understand that. Uh, uh, not sure if that there isn't probably an ideal translation, but at least we can understand what is going on, which is helpful. Uh, but still, it is not a clear why that should be the case. Yeah, it is not obvious at all. Uh, choices lead to consciousness. That's also very obscure. Why does choices lead to consciousness? Uh, very difficult to understand. You can maybe understand the sentence, you understand the English words, uh, but what actually is going on there, very difficult to really fathom. Uh, Consciousness is a condition for name and form. That also is really, really hard to understand. But from there on, it gets easier. Yeah, the rest of dependent origination is more kind of comprehensible because uh, some of these things we can relate to, like feeling, giving rise to craving, is quite obvious. We all know how that works. Uh, continued existence leading to rebirth, and that, that is a bit more uh, obscure again. But we will get to all of these things. So. Dependent origination is a very, as it stands, very hard to really fathom. And you need to reflect on it a lot to really understand what is going on. But before we look at each of these links, I want to discuss very briefly what the idea of is a condition for. What does that mean? Because in each of these cases, one prior one is a condition for the one that follows. Yeah? So what does it mean that something is a condition for something else? Uh, the Pali word is pachaya, avidja, pachaya, sankara, sankara, pachaya, vinyana, etc. And pachaya is this word he rendered as condition. Uh, so what exactly does it mean? And uh, to understand what it means, uh, there is an abstract formula found in the suttas, which I recognize now I should have included, but I, I forgot to include it. The reason is because I'm usually in a bit of hurry when I put these things together, so I whack a few suttas together and I, I use a lot of what I've used before to make it easy for myself. Otherwise, it takes too much time sometimes to prepare otherwise for these uh, retreats. Uh, but uh, So sometimes you think, oh, I should have included that sutta, which I should, uh, but I didn't. Uh, so that is my bad, as they say here. So, but in that uh, formula, it says that when this exists, uh, that exists. Uh, when this comes into being, that comes into being. Uh, when this ceases, uh, that ceases. Uh, when this does not exist, uh, that does not exist. Uh, yeah? Or something like, something very close to that. Maybe I got the sequence slightly wrong in the last two. But, um, so what, that, that is what it's saying, what does that mean? Uh, when this arises, that arises. When this exists, that exists. It means that it is 
what it means is that when one thing exists, the other one has to follow as a consequence of the prior one. Yeah? So when there is avijja, you have to have sankharas. When there is ignorance, you have to have choices. It is not something that you can avoid. So as long as there is ignorance there, that has to follow as a consequence. And because the consequence of having choices is that there is vinyana, vinyana must follow from that. And in this way, each step follows along from the previous one as a matter of course. There is no choice in the matter. As long as you have avidya, you have to have dukkha, which is the last point in this whole list. Uh, yeah, so there is no such thing as happiness with, that, with uh, ignorance. Uh, if you are ignorant, if you are deluded, you cannot be happy. At least not fully happy, not happy in the Buddhist way. Not Achieve, you can't achieve the ultimate happiness. You can't end dukkha without uh, ending avijja. When this exists, uh, that exists. When this arises, that also arises. Uh, yeah? The forward movement of this uh, dependent origination is inexorable, uh, it's inevitable, it has to happen. Uh, yeah? There's no, th it cannot be any other way. It's a law of nature that it happens in this way. Uh. So that is one side of conditioning, that when you have one, the others must happen. The reverse side is that when this does not exist, that does not exist. With the cessation of this, that ceases. So what that means is that when ignorance is gone, then choices also have to disappear. They cannot live without ig ignorance. Yeah? So if you are wise, fully wise, fully woken up to the truth, then you won't make these choices anymore. And because choices stop, consciousness will stop. Because consciousness stops, name and form will stop. Because name and form stops, every step all the way down, all the way down to dukkha, also stops. Yeah, this is the beauty of this whole sequence. And uh, sometimes this is called, in English language, this, this sequence is very similar to what is sometimes in philosophy, apparently, Ajahn Brahm pointed this out to me long, many, many, long time ago because uh, this was maybe something that he learned at Cambridge, I'm not sure, but this was something that it can be understood in terms of what he called sufficient and necessary conditions. And the, when something is a sufficient condition, it means that if A, if avidja arises, if avidja is a sufficient condition for choice, and choice must follow from ignorance. So ignorance is a sufficient condition for choice, it means that it must follow from choice. So independent origination, each link is a sufficient condition for the next one, and that means that each link follows according to the next one. And a necessary condition means that it has to be present for the next one to follow. So if there is no ignorance, yeah, if that is completely absent, sorry, if there's no ignorance, yes, if that is completely absent, then choices cannot follow. Because ignorance is a necessary condition for choices. If it is not there, choices cannot arise. This gets a bit technical, you don't have to worry too much about that. But the general idea is just that when there is ignorance, all the other steps have to come about as a consequence. If there is no ignorance, every step afterwards also will cease as a consequence. That is the main idea behind conditionality here. Uh, yes? Are you seeing uh, anyone who just translate this? The Ajahn Sujato, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've never seen uh, <coughs> translation. No. Sure, I'll get to this later on, because I, I, I'm going to talk about these things a lot in, in a sooner. I, I, it's true, this is his, his unique translation. He has many unique translations. Uh, but uh, when you, at the very beginning of the sutta, because it says mendicants, he's also the only one who uses mendicants. Uh, so when you see mendicants, straight away you know, Ajahn Sujato, Ajahn Sujato. That's how you know it is him. This is the giveaway at the very beginning there. Yeah. So this is his, his way of translating this. It's actually not a very, not a very bad translation. And my preferred translation these days is activities, I think. Uh, because activities is what uh, we do as a consequence of... Uh, sankhara is the activity of the mind that leads to body and speech activities and all of this. Uh, 
Yeah. I, I hate that. I told, I, I told Vicky Bodhi that to change it, and he did it. He did it on my, my advice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's in the same uh, sang it's in the same Sangyuta, number twelve. I can't remember which Sutta forty four, maybe something like that. Uh, yeah, not sh can't remember now. Yeah. To me, mental volition, mental formation, to me is this very not 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 volition, not volitional formation, not mental formation. Volitional formation is this trans bigger body's previous translation. Uh, and uh, I think I don't know. In my experience, a lot of people find it hard to really grasp what it means. Uh, volitional formation. Even the word volition in English is quite an unusual word. Uh, and when you combine it with formation, formation is a very kind of um, ambiguous word. The reason why Bhikkhu Bodhi uses the word formation there is because he's trying to straddle two different meanings of Sankara. Because Sankara has two meanings in Pali. It either is that which forms and creates something else, or it is the outcome of the creation process. Uh, sankara is something which has been made, or it is a force that creates. So his idea when he used the word formation is to try to combine those two in English. So formation is something which both forms and also is the outcome of the formation process. But I don't think it works. I think it is too hard to really understand that. And I think it's better to divide up those two different meanings of Sankara and then give them different translation to make it more clear what is going on. So. That which is formed, okay, that can be called a formation. When sankara is used as sabbe sankara dukkha, then you can say all formations are dukkha or suffering. It makes sense because then everything which has been created and formed is dukkha. Or you can say all phenomena, all created phenomena are dukkha, etc. But uh, when it comes to the active side of things, the doing, then I think to me it loses some of its force. The idea that this is an active thing, an active creative act, uh, to me that doesn't really come out from vol the word formation. So I th find that too hard to understand. And so this is the problem when you try to compress all the meanings of a very different language, of a word in a different language, all the different meanings into one word, you lose the nuance and the differences in meaning of what is happening. I think this is what is going on here. Sometimes you need to translate a Pali word in different ways, uh, depending on the context, to give um, fair hearing to all the meanings of the word. Uh. Anyway, that's the way uh, it, it seems to me. Uh. So. Um, but uh, remember that it doesn't matter. If you prefer volitional formations, that's no problem, that's fine. It's just that when you hear the word choice or you hear the word activity or whatever, it gives you a different angle on the same thing. Yeah? It gives you sometimes a broader um, possibility of understanding what is going on. It adds information, maybe, to the idea of Sankara. Okay, and it, it, I, I wasn't really going to get to that yet because I haven't really got that far. But uh, anyway, now we have um, started discussing this. So, um, okay, Venerable Sir, they replied, I will teach you dependent origination. Yes, yeah, so now we have looked at the idea of the uh, what a condition means. Yeah, it is something that must lead to the result, and in the absence, the result cannot occur at all. That is what that is. Uh, uh, the idea of conditioning uh, is about. Uh, and uh, once we have that in place, then uh, it is possible to understand better how this whole thing works uh, and uh, to at appreciate each link and how one link leads on to the next one. Uh. So, first of all, we have avidja, yeah? ignorance, delusion, uh, and uh, it means uh, don't understand reality as it actually is, usually defines as not understanding the Four Noble Truths. So it's kind of interesting, dependent origination is equivalent to the Second Noble Truth, and then within dependent origination you have the Four Noble Truths again at the beginning. So everything really interlocks in a very profound way. This is one of those things here. So. Um, uh, once you are ignorant, because you don't understand what is happiness and what is suffering in the world, yeah, that's one of the things we have been discussing all along. Uh, first noble truth is not understanding dukkha, which also implies not understanding sukkha, 
you neither understand one nor, th nor the other because you don't understand that. Uh, this is one big problem because it means you're going to look for happiness in the wrong place. Uh, yeah, this is the problem. Another aspect of this uh, thing is that, uh, and I'll come back to that later on again, is the idea of non-self. This is also one of the things we don't understand. It's also really part of the broader idea of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and the idea, as long as we think there is a self in here, it feels like we have the power of agency. Uh, yeah, it feels like I'm in charge of my life. Uh, I can do things. I can affect happiness. The problem is that if we try to affect and create happiness based on delusion, uh, based on looking for happiness where there is no happiness, uh, uh, actually looking for suffering when really we want to look for happiness, uh, then of course that agency is kind of useless because the agency can only be used to create suffering and not happiness in the future. But because we are deluded, we think we know there is happiness, and it feels like we have the agency to get that happiness in our life, uh, then we start to make choices. Uh, yeah? We start to uh, uh, have activities, I like activities for Sankara. We do all of these activities in the world. We act by body, we act by speech, we act by mind. That's what it meant by activities. Uh, or if you want to use volitional formations, we are using our will yeah, to create things in the world. Volition is just another word for will, really. Volition is a, is a very kind of peculiar English word for the will. So we use the will to try to create, to make that happiness in our life. And it's obvious, when you think about it, it's very obvious that that is what is happening. You use your willpower all the time whenever you do something from the moment in the morning when you get up uh, you have your breakfast yeah you get dressed in the morning you go to work all of that is the will in action making choices continuously based on this idea that you're going to procure happiness for yourself all the choices you make are a kind of choice to have happiness you came here yeah because you, th you thought this was going to be happy until you found out it's going to be about dependent origination uh, and then maybe you realize actually it's going to be dukkha after all <laughs> it's too hard to understand yeah nobody comes how can you come to listen to this and think it's going to be happy well maybe hopefully in the long run it's going to be more have some good consequences hopefully it better be otherwise <laughs> i'm going to ask for my money back otherwise i'm not going <laughs> to so Based on that delusion, we try to create happiness. We get an education, yeah? We think that's going to make us happy in the world. We get a job that's going to make us happy in the world. We get into relationships. The relationships are going to make us happy, yeah? We do all of these things. We become a Buddhist. Yeah, at least Buddhism is going to make me happy. Maybe, yeah, depends how you do it. If you do it well, it will work out. But just being a Buddhist isn't enough. You have to really go for it. Uh, all of these things are these choices uh, where we seek uh, for happiness in the world based on the delusion that we think we know where happiness is and the delusion that we have the agency to make it come about. Uh, this utter, the sense of self inside of us. Uh. Now when you make these choices, uh, sometimes the choices are made on uh, uh, a good basis, a good motivation, yeah? They are made on a compassion for others as well. It's not just for looking after yourself, but also you're kind to others. Sometimes we are kind. Sometimes they are based on the uh, idea of uh, uh, com yeah, compassion, metta, whatever. And then when our choices are based on generosity and kindness, uh, then we are, that affects our consciousness. Uh, as I was saying before, if you look very carefully, at yourself, when you are kind, you will see that there is a connection between your kindness towards others and how you feel about yourself. Yeah? If you are kind, you tend to feel better about yourself. And if you are the opposite, if you are unkind or deliberately nasty towards somebody, you tend to feel bad about yourself. And that feeling, how you feel about yourself, is really what is meant by consciousness here. Because consciousness, if you are continuously kind, it's as if your consciousness is gradually being elevated. You're going to a higher state of consciousness. That higher state is really a consciousness which is brighter, lighter, happier, yeah? more content or whatever. So consciousness is directly influenced by the choices that we make in life. If you make lots of bad choices based on 
ill will and greed and all of this, you're doing the exact opposite. You're dragging the consciousness down. It's getting darker, heavier, more unpleasant, more bad feelings, and you're dragging yourself down. A lot of the time, we just make a mixture, yeah, of con mixture of actions. We go a bit up and down, a bit up and down, and it kind of levels out, maybe kind of trending down a little bit. That's I think is quite common as a trending down. But if you are a good Buddhist, maybe you're flat, or maybe even trending upwards. So this is how consciousness then is choices affect consciousness in this way. So at the end of your life. Yeah, you have affected your consciousness in all of this way by all of your choices, uh, then when you die, your consciousness will be at a certain level, yeah, depending on how you lived your life. Uh, and that level is what starts out your new existence. You already, this is called the vinyana titi. Titi means a station or place of consciousness. Uh, so you have stationed your consciousness at a certain level, and then that consciousness carries on from there. Uh, so if you have raised your consciousness during this life, uh, then when you die, it will continue at that level. Uh, yeah, because that's what consciousness does. Unless it has more choices, input to either bring it up or down, it will continue at that level where it is. Uh, if you have made your consciousness dark and heavy, then when you die, it will continue at a dark and heavy state when you die afterwards. Uh. So this is how Rebirth happens, yeah? It's that consciousness is affected in this life. You build it up or you build it down, and then it carries on like that in, your fu in its future life uh, because of how you have uh, affected it in this life. Uh, it kind of makes sense, yeah? Because it's how it is in this life as well. If you lift up your consciousness, you generally feel better about yourself. So it's more that you have changed your general level of consciousness. Uh, it makes sense that that then carries on when you die here. Uh, that's how this, part, this process then works. Uh. Make sense? Yeah. I'm talking a lot. I, as soon as I worry, I talk too much. Please tell me to shut up when I talk too much. Otherwise, uh, we get into trouble. <laughs> yes, please. Uh. Consciousness here, you can think of it as the mind. Yeah? Uh, conscious in the in the Pali suit, as mind and consciousness are very closely related to each other, and sometimes the word mind is actually used instead of consciousness. So these two are very interchangeable. Mano, mano, uh, or chitta, yeah, chitta, mano, and vinyana are sometimes used as syn synonyms in the suttas to mean the same thing. So uh, the reason why consciousness here is pulled apart will become clear when we come to the next next link, which is Nama Rupa, because Nama Rupa is actually all, the, other, the mind is quite diverse, there's many things in the mind, you feel things, you perceive things, uh, so consciousness is really just the awareness of the mind, that's what it means. Uh, the other aspects of the mind have different names, uh, that's why it pulled apart, but really it is also the essential thing that makes it the mind, so it's actually very similar to mind itself. Uh, so it is the mind that you imbue with brightness and lightness. It's the mind that you imbue with darkness, yeah, A as you make choices. This is what kamma is all about. Uh, and this is the best way to think about kamma, yeah? You are creating kamma, basically just means that you are affecting your consciousness in this way, and then the consciousness carries on. That's why you get reborn in a good birth, uh, because your mind has had a positive support, and then it's natural to continue there. Otherwise, kamma sounds like magic. Yeah, you give a certain donation, and bang, you get reborn in a nice mansion. So that sounds like magic. But this is the real mechanism. It's actually it is how it affects consciousness in this life that is the mechanism that then allows you to continue in the good states when you die. Here, kind of interesting, isn't it? It certainly comes together very nicely. I hope, <laughs> unless you get a headache from it, in which case it doesn't, maybe. But uh, yes, please. Okay, weigh in first. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Does have to do sankara. Some, uh, sankara have yeah. to do with karoti. Does that do? Yes, it does. It is directly related to the word doing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's why it's karma. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah. when you were saying titi, does it have to do with titati and yeah. standing? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ali is great. <laughs> yeah. So what she is, what Wai Yin is saying, for those of you who may not understand, I'll just elaborate a little bit. And there's a good point, and actually makes it clear what is going on, that sankara is related to the word karoti. Karoti in Pali means to do, to act, to create. And sang is a prefix which means something like putting together. Yeah? So sankara is uh, related to sang, karoti, which then means to put things together. Yeah? In other words, to create things. Yeah? So this is a creative action. Uh, and uh, so this is the, the creative force of the mind. We're creating the future. Uh, so it could maybe call this creation. Yeah? From ignorance comes creation. Uh. <laughs> That would be interesting, wouldn't it? It comes creation. This is how creation happens. Uh, yeah? It's not God creating the world, it's we create the world. Yeah? yeah, that's a good one. So we can get creation in there as well. Now that is an interesting translation, maybe. No. <laughs> so um, uh, delusion, uh, conditions, creation, creation, condi yeah, that's, that's really nice. Okay, anyway, so that was, uh, sorry, please come back. Yeah. Once asked me, uh, "What yeah. am I gonna do?" I said, "Keep it in Pali." So you're gonna keep it in Pali. Keep it in Pali. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah. So um, so uh, the um, so cr so cr that's interesting. So basically, creation. Yeah, is another way of thinking about this because we create things in this way. It's the creative activity. Is really what sankara is about. It comes from the root word meaning to make. That is one part. The other thing you mentioned, which is uh, true, that you don't, you don't have to be as uh, sophisticated as Wai Yin in terms of Pali and things to understand what is going on here, but uh, she, she kind of. But it's interesting the point she's making. Vinyana titi is related to the word vinyana consciousness. Titi is from the word titati, which means to stand or remain. So it means the consciousness is like standing at a certain level. Yeah, it's placed. It is the. That's why it is called the um, uh, the, the platform of consciousness or the station of consciousness because it stands at that particular uh, level. Uh, so that is a that is a very good point. Uh. Okay, please. Would you like to ask as well? Yeah, you better come up. Do you, would you mind coming up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Ajahn, you mentioned about consciousness, mm. uh, mind awareness. So is it linked to like the uh, right thoughts, right speech, and um, those way of practicing and aware of your mind and consciousness? Um, uh, sankara is really where the right speech and right thoughts come in. Yeah, Sankara, the previous link, choices, that's where that comes in. The choices is all about either you make good choices or bad choices, whether you speak right or whether you act right or you speak wrong. That's where that comes in. And uh, wherever, whenever you speak or act in the right or, or wrong way, it will affect your mind, it will affect your consciousness. Yeah? And notice that in your own life. It's something you can see in your own life. Feel, you can feel it directly. If you do something which is not so nice, it feels feel bad afterwards, yeah, you have let yourself down. You actually, the only person you're really letting down is yourself, because you feel bad about it. But if you do an act of kindness, you're actually lifting yourself up, and you're supporting yourself, and you're giving yourself a boost by, uh, if you want to be kind to yourself, be kind to others. That's that old saying, it's a beautiful saying. If you are not kind to others, you're being nasty to yourself, you're being like your own enemy. That's what they're actually, this is a direct quote from the suttas, uh, how the Buddha talks about this. So, and that is how the consciousness then is related to how we live, the activities that we do, the creations that we make. And this is how we actually create the world. Remember, the world is just our experience. That's the world. That's the only world that can be. What I experience now, this is my world. What each one of you experience now, that's your world. And beyond that, we don't know very much. Yeah, This is really the old world that we know about. Everything else is just an extrapolation is a result of that particular world, the whole world of physics and all of that, it just comes from, it's derived from our per first personal experience of the world. This is the basic world there is. Uh, so in Buddhism, when we talk about the world, we mean our world, and your world is created 
by your choices. Uh, so creation, uh, creation of the world uh, happens in that way. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but uh, I can, maybe we can have a look at a few suttas that make that more clear as well, such as the Rohi, famous Rohitasa Sutta, where uh, the uh, world is said to be, that, uh, be in this fathom-long body endowed with perception and consciousness, uh, is what you find in the Rohitasa Sutta. Anyway, so now consciousness has been taken to a certain level, you die, you continue at that level, yeah? Because you have taken the consciousness to a certain level, your experiences in your next life will be limited to that level, obviously. If you are in Deva Loka, you cannot experience the feelings of animals or humans. Also, you cannot experience the feelings of the Brahma Loka. Yeah? You are limited to the Deva Loka experiences, because that's where you're reborn. So that's what Nama Rupa means here. Namarupa is the experiences you can have in that realm. They are constrained by that realm that you have been re reborn into because your consciousness has such a characteristic. So if you are a human being, then Namarupa, yeah, it is we have certain feelings as human beings. Sometimes as human beings is interesting because I, I, we can develop our mind in very strong ways as human beings, either up and down. So sometimes you can experience Devaloka directly here and now by developing your mind in meditation, yeah? which is interesting. But if you, s if you look aside from that, if you look instead look at the general feeling of what it is to be a human, you can expect certain things. Yeah? Food is a very kind of human feeling that we have. You expect certain foods, you expect relationships, you expect jobs, you expect sometimes having suffering in life, people dying, you know, all of these kind of things. All of that is within the realm of human experience. And that is what you can expect as a human being. So this is Nama Rupa, this is the feelings you have, the perceptions that we have. Yeah, We perceive people, we perceive food, we perceive enemies, and, and we pre all these perceptions that we may use to make sense of the world have a certain quality because we are in the human realm. Uh, our choices are limited usually to that realm as well, so our choices will be within that realm. Uh, yeah? And our bodies, the physical form, these are the other uh, khandas we're talking about here, will also be limited by that realm. Uh, so one way, an easy way of thinking about Nama Rupa is to think of it as the four khandas apart from consciousness. Yeah? Rupa, Vedana, Sanya and Sankara. The other four khandas, form, feeling, perception and choices, volitional formations, activities, whatever you want to call it, Sankara, the last one. Uh, so um, uh, that's, those are then locked in because you have been born in a certain place. If you're reborn as a deva, those namarupa will be different. Yeah? They will be higher, there will be more pleasure, the perceptions will be more beautiful, your choices will be different because you will choose those things that belong to the deva loka. You, your body will be, will be different. Yeah? If you go in the hell realm, these things will be different again. Uh, so in this way, Nama Rupa are formed, are decided by consciousness, by the level of consciousness. Yeah? I get into this in more detail later on, because it's quite, quite interesting in many ways. So once you then you are reborn in a certain realm, then you have the Salayatana, the six sense fields, I think it's called here. I can, I can just barely make it out without glasses. I really have to, even though the text is so large, jeepers, my eyesight is getting really bad. This is old age happening, it got coming going very faster and faster every year, I'm getting more and more blurry as I go on. So six sense fields, yeah, which is the six senses in uh, Buddhism, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and the mind, yeah. So usually you have all six sense fields, not always, certain rebirths you don't, but uh, let's just assume you have the six sense fields. And this comes with Nama Rupa. If you have form, you have the six sense fields. And then those six sense fields are what enable you to take in that world. Yeah, you take in the world. This is how we experience things. It's through those six sense fields. And that taking in of the world, when it happens, that's contact with that world. Yeah, you can feel contact right now. It's the fact that you're able to see. You're contacting the world through your eyes. When you're listening, you're contacting the world through your ears. Uh, when you're tasting, you're contacting the world through flavors. Uh, 
yeah, etc., etc. That is contact. It's just the meeting of consciousness, the sense, and the external object. Yeah, if you're conscious and you see something, then that's contact. Three things coming together. Then, once you have that contact, once you see something, well, you have some feeling about it. You think, oh, this is a very nice room. Yeah, we're sitting here, very nice, except for that. There's something missing over there that's really ugly. Yeah, this, see that little square over there? Whoa! So then you have nice perception, nice perception, bad perception. Then you have nice perception, nice perception as you go down the wall. This is how you have then happy, happy feeling, happy feeling, negative feeling, positive feeling, positive feeling. Well, it depends how fault finding you are. Maybe you don't care if that's missing or not. Yeah? If you're wise, you just ignore it. But if you're not wise, you might think, yeah, we've got to do something about that. Yeah, I don't think like that because I don't, I don't really belong here. So for me, it doesn't matter. But maybe if you feel like the owner, you will think like that. Uh, so then you have negative feelings arising, yeah? Th feelings you don't like. That comes from contact. And then, because of that feeling, then you will crave, yeah? According to those feelings. If there's something you like, you will desire it. You want more of it. You will think about it. If there's something you dislike, you want to avoid it. Oh, Terrible, and then you crave to get rid of it. These are the two main kinds of craving in the sensual realm, or any realm at all. Attraction and aversion, like we talked about before in the sense restraint formula. Yes, you crave, and what happens when you crave is that you want to ensure that your craving is satisfied in the future. So how do we ensure that our cravings are satisfied? Well, we take certain things up that uh, try to ensure our cravings are satisfied. What other things we take up? Well, some of the big things that we take up in life is like relationship. Yeah, we get married maybe to somebody, uh, yeah, and we have a long-term relationship. This is one way of satisfying craving. In many ways, relationships are about many things. Yeah, they are about a sense of security, they are about friendship, they are about Lots of things, uh, not just about physical intimacy, but about many, many things that kind of make life more meaningful. That's why we have these relationships. Uh, and um, that it's broadened out to uh, you know, also include other uh, friends as well. So these are the big things that we take up in life. Then we take up uh, an education and then a job. Yeah? This is also to ensure that we have an income, uh, to make sure that we can live well, that we can satisfy our cravings. That's why we have a job, uh, an uh, education. Uh, then we have a home. A home is also a place where we satisfy our cravings. It's a place where you, have the, you feel secure, the place where you feel that like you can put the world away so you don't have to be around people all the time. It's a place where you can satisfy maybe your Desire for entertainment, yeah, is a place where you can sleep safely at night, you have a good night's rest. So home is a very important place to satisfy cravings as well. So we take up home ownership, we take up relationships, we take up a um, education and a job, we take up a religion. Yeah, why do we do that? Well, that also comes from craving. We want to be happy. We want to reduce suffering in our life. And one of the most important things we can do, from a Buddhist point of view, is to take up a sensible spiritual teaching. It doesn't ha even have to be a religion. You don't have to call it that. Uh, but if you have a sensible spiritual teaching in your life, that will be one of the really powerful things to help you in the right way. Uh. So this is upadana. This is then the ninth factor of dependent origination. Yeah, taking things up. Uh, this is like almost like a strategy to ensure that your craving is satisfied. Uh, yeah? Then when you have upadana, you have bhava. You tend to exist in a certain way depending on all the things that you take up. So what is your bhava? And the way to think about your bhava is to think about the things that concern you in life. Yeah? So if you sit in meditation practice and you are thinking about certain things, what are the things that your mind tends to come back to that interest you? And if you are interested in all the worldly things, it means that the bhava you are in is like the sensual realm. You think about your job, you think about the family, you plan for the future, you think about the 
maybe even the pleasures you're going to have, yeah, all of these kind of things. Your bhava is in the sensual realm. That's where you exist mentally. And because you exist mentally, it also means that externally as well, that's where you enjoy yourself. But if instead, in your, when you close your eyes and you meditate, you start to, you're interested in meditation practice instead, so you just enjoy the peace, you enjoy the calm and all of that, it means your bhava is moving, start to moving away from the sensual realm to higher consciousnesses, yeah? To maybe the, the higher sensual realms, where there's less sensuality, there's more peace. Uh, and eventually taking it all the way to the Brahma realms, to samadhi. And if that is your own interest, it means that your mind will leap to those things uh, when you meditate. That's why someone who is a stream mentor leaps towards samadhi, because they're only interested in those particular realms. The mind goes there straight away. Uh, so this is how you know your realm, yeah, roughly where you are existing in this present life. Upadana, what we take up in life, decides what we are interested in. We take things up, of course, we're interested in that. That shapes the way you think about the world. And then you can figure that out in meditation, roughly where you're stuck, by seeing the thing that your mind tends to return to in your meditation practice. And this is very similar, this bhava then, is very similar to what we talked about before with vinyana, because it means that bhava, that existence that you have, will imbue your mind, your consciousness, uh, with certain qualities. It will be stationed at a certain level, depending on that bhava. You can see how it's symmetrical here, the dependent is symmetrical, the same thing is kind of recurring as you go through this. Uh, and then, because it is stationed at a certain level, you have the jati, yeah, the birth or rebirth happening then as a consequence of that. Uh, yeah, because it, the mind continues on into that next rebirth. Uh, and then you have all the things that come as a consequence of rebirth. Once you're reborn, you are stuffed, as they say. <laughs> then you, you have to experience all the things that come with rebirth. Yeah? And you are, uh, there you are, you have to experience all the dukkha and the things of, uh, oh, w that come with that. Uh. So that is, in brief, the sequence of dependent origination. I'm going to go through it in quite a bit more detail, because that is very fast. Uh, I just wanted to give you a kind of overview before we get into the detailed exposition. So you have, there's a bit more chance you will get something out of it when we get to this. Uh. So, um, I don't want to say too much more before we have a break, because I'm concerned it's going to be uh, too much. Are there any f more questions about this before we carry on? Uh, does anyone want to ask anything here? Are you here? Uh, uh, what I said so far made sense? Yeah, yeah, I think. Please. Uh. So, what is ignorance uh, being conditioned by? Yeah, this is a very important point, and this is what I want to, I'm going to get back to that later on. Once I go into more detail with each step, I'm going to talk about the conditioning of, of ignorance. But in brief, it's a good question, and then the, there's only a few places in the suttas that talk about this, and they say that the uh, condition for ignorance uh, is the five hindrances. Uh, yeah, and that's a very interesting little point. You can think about that, that a little bit over the over lunch, if you like. I actually don't think about it; it just blocks up your mind. But uh, it's the five hindrances that that are the uh, uh, cause for ignorance in the long run. So, if you want to reduce ignorance, uh, reduce the five hindrances, uh, and then ultimately you can overthrow that uh, ignorance, that avijja, in that way. Uh, that's how you how you do it. Uh, that's an important point. Uh, but uh, you can also imagine, like I said before, that just practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, that has that exact result, yeah? The exact result of purifying the mind and making it ready to uh, give up ignorance. Uh, what is condition? Sorry? The condition for ignorance. That's another one, that's another one, yeah, yeah, because the five hindrances are, the five hindrances in a sense are ignorance as well, yeah, so, so when you, that's exactly true, so, and that is the problem with delusion, delusion self-perpetuating, it propels itself forward, so if you are ignorant, you will continue to be ignorant, and that's why the delusion is so hard to break, so th that's a good point. Yes, please. Yeah, in the Panchakanda, yeah. Vedana comes before Sankara, 
Yeah. But in the Paticca Sambhupada, Vedana comes long after Sankara. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile that? <laughs> because there are different frameworks, they are pointing to different things. Uh, the purpose of the five khandas is a very different purpose than uh, dependent origination. And it's the purpose of the system that decides the placement. Uh, so the pur purpose of uh, the five khandas is to uh, look at the, uh, what we are as human beings and classify it in a way where we go from the coarser aspect to the more refined aspects. Yeah? So when you go through the meditation process, the most obvious thing that you see fading away in meditation is the body. It's the first thing that fades away in meditation. And you can, so you can understand why rupa is impermanent. Yeah, remember that the five khandhas, the purpose of the five khandhas is for contemplate, contemplating their fading away and cessation. So you can understand their impermanence and dukkha, that's the whole point of it. Uh, this is what releases you from sangsara, the correct contemplation of the five khandhas. That contemplation must happen in a sequence. Uh, and the normal sequence would be first the body, because it's the first thing that disappears. Uh, and then Perception and feeling are very closely related. Yeah, I mean, there is a little bit of ambiguity here, what is the, the right sequence, but feelings start to change also very quickly. You start to get very happy feelings very fast, uh, so you can see the painful feelings disappearing. This happens as soon as you start to get piti sukha. There's very little painful feeling left in the body at that particular point. Yeah? So it happens quite soon. So this. Uh, Contemplation of feelings is possible from a fairly early point of view, but it only gets really profound once you enter jhana, like everything else. Uh, and then you have the uh, uh, perceptions closely related to feeling, but the perceptions also, they, uh, they you know, gradually change, and the big changes in perception happens, for example, when you come to the nimitta stage, yeah? where you kind of lose all feeling for the body and your world gets confined to this one little thing which is like a bright light. Uh, then you have the sense of doing, which is Ankara is all about, which is the activity of the mind. Uh, that comes, that you still feel that you are in charge at this particular point. It feels like you are in control. And because you feel like you are in control, it feels like Sankara is available. Sankara really only ends properly when you come to the jhana stages. Uh, it's the first time you can fully understand that sankhara can be completely gone, uh, all volition, all intention can be gone, uh, uh, and still you are there, yeah? you are there because consciousness is there. And then all that remains at that point is consciousness together with the higher feelings and the higher perceptions uh, which are there, and then as you see that consciousness disappearing, then eventually the penny drops, that consciousness too is impermanent and changeable, and then you can see that as impermanent. So it is basically the, se the regular kind of sequence of insight that you have, that's why it has that sequence in the five khandhas. Uh, that is the purpose of the five khandhas, is for insight, for understanding. Yeah. But independent origination is the structure of sangsara that we're trying to see here. Yeah. Yeah, so there it is quite, the purpose is very different. The purpose is to show how we build up, sang, build up sangsara. And uh, how we build up sang, sang, sangsara, one of the most important factors is sankara, which is the creative force that actually builds up everything else. Uh, sankara builds up also itself. The sankara builds up san future sankara. So in a sense, by being reborn, uh, the very fact that you are reborn means that you are establishing all five khandhas in the future life. Uh, and the thing that establishes those five khandhas in the future life uh, is sankhara itself. Uh, that is the creative force there. So it is the purpose of the thing that makes, makes a difference there. Uh, uh, why we are looking at it. Uh, yeah, what, what it's supposed to show us. Uh. Are you happy with that? Uh, you don't look entirely happy. Uh, are you? <laughs> okay. So... Uh, Anyway, let's stop it there because uh, let's have a bit of a break. It's always nice to have a break. So have a nice lunch together and then we'll see you again at 1.30 here.